Hello and welcome back to the CNS Pharmacology Masterclass where we talk about all the medications that work on the central nervous system. And here we will explain the antipsychotic drugs. Those are medications that block dopamine in the central nervous system to treat schizophrenia. And here we will explain all the details related to these medications. You can always use the chapters in the video description to skip to other parts of this video. So let's start with the definition. So antipsychotics, they are also known as neuroleptics. So this is another name for the antipsychotics drugs. And they are drugs that block the dopamine receptors in the central nervous system. And they are used in treatment of psychosis and schizophrenia, as we mentioned. And to understand how antipsychotics work to treat schizophrenia and psychosis, first we need to understand how psychosis and schizophrenia occur at the first place. So let's start with psychosis. So psychosis is a set of symptoms that occur due to many medical and psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia, psychotic depression, and delirium. So psychosis is a set of symptoms. And psychosis is characterized by loss in the perception of reality in the affected person. So the person with psychosis is living in a type of dream. So psychosis symptoms include delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized thoughts. So delusions are false, unshakable beliefs. They could be persecutory or grandiose. So with delusions, the patient have some types of beliefs that are false. And the patient is completely agreeing with these beliefs. And they are on types like persecutory or grandiose. For example, persecutory is the patient feeling that someone is after them and want to hurt them. And persecutory delusions are the most common type of delusions. Like this guy here, he is always thinking that someone is coming after him and want to hurt them and want to hurt him. And the other type of delusions are the grandiose. That's when the patient is feeling they are very powerful, like they are prophet or they know everything about the world. The other symptom of psychosis is the hallucinations. They are false perception of external stimuli. They could be auditory, they could be visual, they could be gustatory, smells, etc. In auditory hallucinations, the patient is hearing someone uh, talking in the background or someone talking to them. In the visual hallucinations, the patient is seeing some stuff that are not real. And gustatory is tasting uh, and with the smells, they are smelling some weird uh, smells. And the third symptom of psychosis is the disorganized thought. That's when the content and form of the patient's thoughts uh, is disorganized. Now let's move to explain schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a mental disorder. So psychosis is a set of symptoms, while schizophrenia is an actual mental disorder that is characterized by recurrent episodes of psychosis. And with psychosis, the schizophrenia is also characterized by cognitive dysfunction and negative symptoms. So schizophrenia is associated with positive symptoms. The psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia, they are called positive symptoms. And they include the same psychotic symptoms like delusions, hallucinations, disorganized thoughts, and abnormal behavior. And schizophrenia is associated with cognitive impairment too, in form of difficulty processing information and decreased attention and trouble with memory. So in schizophrenic patients, memory, attention, and processing speeds are all not normal. And it is also associated with negative symptoms in the form of poverty of speech, social isolation, lack of motivation, and inability to feel pleasure. So again, the schizophrenia is positive symptoms, negative symptoms, 
and cognitive impairment. And schizophrenia symptoms are caused by increased dopamine levels in some dopaminergic pathways. And that is what antipsychotics will target. They will target dopamine. They will block the dopamine so the patient goes back to normal. And to elaborate on this point, we need to explain the dopaminergic pathways and how they are affected by schizophrenia and antipsychotics. So there is four major dopamine pathways in the brain and they include the mesolimbic pathway, the mesocortical pathway, the nigrostriatal pathway and the tuberoinfundibular pathway. So let's start with the first pathway which is the mesolimbic pathway. It transmits dopamine from the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain to the ventral striatum which is formed by the nucleus accumbens and the olfactory bulb. Uh, so this is here the ventral tegmental area in the brain and here we have the ventral striatum and the mesolimbic pathway connects these two with the dopaminergic neurons. So it's like that. This is the mesolimbic pathway. And the functions of this pathway are related to reward cognition, that is the wanting response, the pleasure response from certain stimuli. So when the person is feeling wanting or pleasure, they come from this pathway. And the aversion cognition, which is the strong dislike, so when the person feels strong dislike to some kind of stuff, that the strong dislike is coming from the mesolimbic pathway being activated. Increasing dopamine levels in the mesolimbic pathway lead to psychosis and schizophrenia. So when the dopamine levels exceed their normal levels in this pathway, the patient starts to have psychosis symptoms. And the antipsychotics target this pathway by blocking dopamine to control the psychotic symptoms. So this is one of the targets of the antipsychotic drugs. The second pathway is the mesocortical pathway. The mesocortical pathway transmits dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to the frontal cortex. So here we have the ventral tegmental area and here we have the frontal cortex and this is the mesocortical pathway. It connects these two structures to, together with dopaminergic neurons. And the mesocortical pathway related to the executive functions. So increasing the dopamine levels in the mesocortical pathway lead to schizophrenia. So if the dopamine levels exceed their normal limits in this pathway, this would lead to schizophrenia. And antipsychotics block dopamine in this pathway to control psychotic symptoms. The third pathway is the nigrostriatal pathway. So the nigrostriatal pathway transmits dopamine from the substantia nigra. So this is here is the substantia nigra to the caudate nucleus and butamen to this area here, which is the caudate and butamen. And this is here the nigrostriatal pathway. It transmits dopamine from the substantia nigra to the caudate and butamen, which are all parts of the, of the basal ganglia. And this pathway is related to the motor functions, the reward related cognition and associative learning. So if the dopamine levels in this pathway decrease, then this lead to extra pyramidal side effects similar to Parkinson's disease. So this pathway is the opposite of the first two pathways. So when the dopamine decrease in this pathway, that is when the abnormality will start. And this abnormality is in form of Parkinson's symptoms. So Parkinson's is a movement disorder characterized by tremors, dyskinesia, cogwheel rigidity, stooped posture, and shuffling gait. And when the dopamine decrease in this pathway, the nigrostriatal pathway, the patient start having Parkinson's-like symptoms, or they are called 
extrapyramidal symptoms, and those will be explained more in the adverse effects chapter of this video. Because remember, the antipsychotics block dopamine, and it also block it in this pathway leading to Parkinson's like symptoms. Because of the antipsychotics blocking dopamine in all of the brain, then some areas would benefit from that in form of the mesolimbic and the mesocortical pathways, they will benefit from that, but the nigrostriatal pathway will not benefit from the blocking of dopamine leading to side effects. The final pathway is the tubero infundibular pathway. It transmits dopamine from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. So this is here is the tubero infundibular pathway transmits dopamine from the hypothalamus to the pituitary here. And this pathway function is to regulate the prolactin secretion. And if the dopamine levels decrease in this pathway, this lead to hyperprolactinemia. So this is another pathway where antipsychotics will harm this pathway. So antipsychotics block dopamine in this pathway, thus leading to hyperprolactinemia, and this lead to side effects like decreased libido, sexual dysfunction, and infertility as a result of the hyperprolactinemia. Now, after we explain the schizophrenia symptoms and how they are managed by the antipsychotics, now let's talk about the classification of the antipsychotics. So the antipsychotics are classified into typical antipsychotics and atypical antipsychotics. The typical antipsychotics are also known as the old antipsychotics. Uh, another name for them is the first generation antipsychotics. And they are developed in the 1950s. Examples for them is the chlorbromazine and the haloperidol. The atypical antipsychotics are also known as the new antipsychotics and the second generation antipsychotics. And they are developed in the 1970s. Examples for them is the risperidone, the olanzapine, and the clozapine, which is used in resistant cases. Now let's talk about the mechanism of action of the typical antipsychotics, which also known as the old or the first generation antipsychotics. So they block a lot of receptors, mainly the dopamine D2 receptors, and that is why they are more likely to be associated with extrapyramidal symptoms like tremors and dyskinesia. So those antipsychotic drugs are block dopamine receptors, which lead to extrapyramidal symptoms. Now let's talk about the mechanism of action of the atypical antipsychotics. They also block the dopamine receptors, but this time to a lesser degree than the typical antipsychotics do. And they also block the serotonin 5-HT receptors, the muscarinic and alpha-adrenergic receptors, and that's what differentiates them from the typical antipsychotics. They also block the serotonin receptors, the muscarinic and the alpha adrenergic receptors. And they are associated with lower incidence of the extrapyramidal symptoms that typical antipsychotic lead to because they block dopamine to a lesser degree. And with the use of the atypical antipsychotics, there is a higher risk of metabolic adverse effects such as weight gain, hyper cholesterolemia, and diabetes mellitus. Now let's talk about the therapeutic uses of these medications. So both typical and atypical antipsychotic drugs are used in treatment of schizophrenia. Atypicals are used as if the first line nowadays because they produce less extrapyramidal symptoms. But typicals has much better efficacy than atypicals in managing schizophrenia positive symptoms. So the typicals manage the positive symptoms like delusions, hallucinations better, but the atypicals are associated with, le with less adverse effects 
And that is why the atypicals are the first line because they are associated with less adverse effects. And cases where there is no sufficient response to the typicals and atypicals, which are called the refractory cases, then clozapine is used, which is atypical antipsychotics, and it is associated with bone marrow suppression. So we should look for that when we use it uh, in treatment of certain cases. Negative symptoms of schizophrenia are better managed with the atypicals. So atypical antipsychotics are better in managing the negative symptoms, but they are worse in managing the positive symptoms. Chlorobromazine, sometimes used to relieve the intractable hiccups, chlorobromazine is a first generation antipsychotic. And typicals are used in treatment of severe nausea and vomiting because they block the dopamine D2 receptors in the chemoreceptor trigger zone in the medulla oblongata, and that would relieve the nausea and vomiting. And antipsychotics are also used in treatment of agitation and aggressive behaviors secondary to other disorders like autism, for example. And pimozide, which is, which is a first generation antipsychotic medication, is indicated for treatment of tics and Tourette disorder. And antipsychotics are also used in management of manic and mixed episodes of bipolar disorder. Paliburidone, which is a second generation antipsychotic, is used in the treatment of schizoaffective disorder. And antipsychotics are also used in treatment of depression, refractory to antidepressant and other treatment lines. If, the, if those failed, then we can use antipsychotics to treat depression. Now let's move on to talk about the adverse effects of the treatment with antipsychotic drugs. So the first one being the extrapyramidal manifestations. So those occur as a result of blocking the dopamine D2 receptors in the nigrostriatal pathway in the basal ganglia. As we mentioned before, when we block the nigrostriatal pathway, this would lead to extrapyramidal symptoms. And they include uh, tremors, which is shaking movements, rigidity, which is hypertonia. Hypertonia is a resistance to passive movement. When, so when we try to passively move one of the patient joints, we see that there is resistance to that movement. They also include the dystonia, the akathasia, and the dyskinesia. So dystonia is a sustained muscle contraction. Dystonia usually occurs with a few hours to days after the treatment of the antipsychotic drugs. So in this patient, for example, you can see that his neck is sustainedly contracted and his arm too. In this clip, you can see the patient leg is contracting and it will be contracted for several minutes to hours. And that is what we call dystonia. Akathasia is another extrapyramidal manifestation, which is inability to remain still. The patient keep moving, they can't stay still. As you can see in this clip, the patient is moving always, they can't stay still even when they are sleeping. And rigidity, which is hypertonia, and trauma, which is shaking movements, occur within weeks to months after starting the treatment. And also there is dyskinesia. Dyskinesia is involuntary repetitive muscle movements that occur with long-term treatment with antipsychotics. So the patients start having some type of repetitive movements, like moving their tongues or their lips or some part of their face or their limbs. And the extrapyramidal manifestations can be treated by administration of anticholinergic drug that work on the central nervous system. For example, the benzotropine. Uh, but the akathasia will respond better to beta blockers like propranolol, for example. Now, after we explained the extrapyramidal adverse effects, now let's talk about the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, 
which is the second adverse effect of the antipsychotic drugs. So neuroleptic means antipsychotic medication, and malignant means it is a serious thing, and syndrome means it is a set of symptoms. So it is a serious complication with mortality rate of 20%. And it occurs with typical antipsychotics more, and it, it is present as autonomic disturbance in form of muscle rigidity, hyperthermia, high blood pressure, sweating, and myoglobinemia. So when the patient starts having th these symptoms, you should stop the antipsychotic treatment and do supportive treatment to relieve those symptoms. Antipsychotics also lead to hyperprolactinemia, which occur more with the typical antipsychotics, and it lead to sexual dysfunction, gynecomastia, and amenorrhea. And the antipsychotics block the alpha adrenergic receptors, leading to postural hypotension and lightheadedness. And this occur especially with atypical antipsychotics more. And some antipsychotics block the muscarinic receptors, like the chlorpromazine, the clozapine, and the olanazepine, leading to anticholinergic effects like blurred vision, dry mouth, confusion, and constipation. Antipsychotics also lead to weight gain, hyperglycemia, especially the atypical antipsychotics, because of the serotonin receptor blockage. And the clozapine lead to agranulocytosis, as we mentioned before, and some antipsychotics may lead to prolongation of the QT interval in the heart, leading to cardiac arrhythmias, especially the chlorpromazine, and they also lead to cholestatic jaundice. Finally, let's talk about some cautions in the use of the antipsychotic drugs. So antipsychotics may increase the seizures in seizure disorder patients and they carry increased mortality if used in elderly patients with dementia and psychosis. And they may lead to suicidal ideation or behaviors if used in mood disorders patients. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support more, you can by subscribing to the Patreon, link provided in the description of this video. Thank you for watching and peace.